Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Michelle Villagran, Chair of the San Jose State University School of Information Diversity Committee. And I want to welcome you to our 2020 Diversity Webinar Series for our university, faculty, alumni, and students. Our presenters will be fostering discussion around sharing content and diverse topics which align with our goals of inclusive excellence, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm very excited today as this is the third webinar in our eight part series. With that, I would like to introduce today's session, Beyond Library Services to Immigrants, a discussion on the role of information in migration and presented by Dr. Anna Ndumu. Turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Villagran. Um, I am very excited to be here today and I'd like to first thank you um, as well as your colleagues and the iSchool at San Jose State University. I'm delighted to be joining everyone. Um, so I am a professor at the University of Maryland College Parks iSchool and my research centers on the role of libraries and information uh, in the lives of all kinds of marginalized communities, but especially immigrants. So that's a little bit about me. And let me tell you a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. First, I'll give some context on the relationship between libraries and immigration. And then I'll introduce some new conceptual directions, uh, ways that we can reframe how we approach and relate to immigrant communities. And then uh, I hope to provide some practical takeaways for you to apply in your uh, work setting or in your uh, academics. And then we'll close with some Q&A and just a little bit of housekeeping or administrivia. Like many of you, my household is a little cray cray right now um, and it gets loud. So if you hear a little rustling in the background, that's just a white noise machine. And I'm hoping that it's not too distracting. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So there are 244 million immigrants all around the world and 47 million of these individuals call the U.S. home. And the U.S. has the largest and most diverse population of immigrants of any other country. And about one in seven people uh, identify as having uh, non-U.S. origins or family members who migrated to the U.S. And that is based on the 2010 census. And it is anticipated that the 2020 census will uh, uncover even uh, more diversity in terms of ethnic origins. So library service to immigrants has been a long-standing and uh, really century-old uh, service within library communities and many of the services that we now know and recognize as being kind of quintessential library services such as English language learning, uh, Children's Story Hour, and a host of other programs uh, originated as a way to connect with non-U.S. born communities. However, there have been some problematic kind of uh, approaches within libraries uh, toward immigrant communities. And especially at the turn of the 20th century when millions and millions of European immigrants uh, uh, migrated to New York and the northern corridor of the U.S., there were a lot of misunderstandings and uh, at the same time overestimation of librarians' roles in their lives. And we saw a lot of rescue narratives um, and John Foster Carr, who was very influ influential within uh, the American Library Association, he published a lot and he formed one of the first committees, the Committee on Work with the Foreign Born within ALA. It's undeceived of the failings of alien newcomers, but they also understand their possibilities. And we see early on a lot of this uh, type of discourse that problematizes and kind of um, others uh, immigrant communities. And John Foster Carr, he uh, published a lot on uh, immigrants and how to reach immigrants, but a lot of his publications uh, were uh, kind of button pushing, <laughs> to put it mildly. 
if not prejudiced. So again, he wrote, we're altruists playing Cinderella on short rations, but the joy we get of doing something for nothing. Some weeks we get nothing out of it but mud. Uh, I have the pleasure of scrubbing up some dear Italian boy. Um, so this is the kind of dialogue that took place. We also see Childers and Post who published um, an influential book called The uh, information poor in America. And a lot of scholars went on to glean from that book. Um, so again, this was a very pivotal publication and they wrote, for example, immigrants are not predisposed as a general population to alter the undesirable condition of their lives or to see information as an instrument in their salvation. So again, we see this idea of librarians being um, saviors or uh, immigrants being fatally information dispossessed. Um, and again, just like today's rhetoric, uh, especially when it comes to Central American and Mexican communities, Childress and Post wrote that many groups, um, not just immigrants, but people of color, people with disabilities, uh, um, are isolated from information that sustains the dominant society because a number of characteristics magnify their isolation they are proud of their culture and especially tenacious in their language. They distrust or dislike Anglo institutions such as schools, medical clinics, public housing, etc. So these were the types of blanket statements that were made about immigrants. Uh, we see again um, in the 21st century, there's still this idea of immigrants being uh, information impoverished and universally and fatally information impoverished. And Shen writes, for example, as one of the key information poor groups, urban immigrants are affected by lack of English proficiency, education, technology skills, and equal access to information. And so Shen fails to operationalize what he or she means by urban immigrants um, and just, again, makes a, a, a very vast and wide and um, problematic assumption about immigrants' information capacities. You'll see that um, my work involves how libraries can reframe how they approach immigrants. And there are three problems or paradoxes is what I call them. The first paradox is gross underestimation. Um, while other fields such as demography and population studies see that uh, information and technology, especially the smartphone, are incredibly important um, and being used in vibrant ways among immigrant communities, libraries have not caught up to that reality. So there's an underestimation of what immigrants do and handle and how they customize information. And then the second paradox or irony is that there is homogenization um, within library communities um, when it comes to understanding immigrants. So for example, uh, Hispanic, the term Hispanic is often conflated with immigrants um, and these are not interchangeable terms and I'll talk about that in a little bit. There are an entire, there are entire classes of groups, sets of groups, immigrant identities that are ignored within LIS literature um, and research. Uh, for example, 
um, black diasporic immigrants have not been covered or their experiences are not amplified. Uh, out of about 4,000 publications that talk about immigration or immigrants, only three uh, centered black diasporic immigrants. So that's very telling. And the last paradox is prescription. Um, in our work, we uh, really have uh, kind of number one, for this to be an area of diversity and inclusion, there is a, a tremendous lack of diversity in how we approach the research. Many of our uh, publications are case study or best practice oriented, meaning that the literature is localized. So there's not a lot of empirical literature or research looking at a nationwide macro level bird's eye view uh, panorama of how immigrants actually uh, customize and apply information in their lives. So uh, we have really operated uh, in a way that we are experts and we prescribe a lot of services. And, um, and so these are the three paradoxes that I argue are limiting our services to immigrants. Uh, okay, now this is gonna be tricky because I did wanna use the pointer. So I'll just explain a little bit um, about uh, what I mean by homogenization and underestimation. And in the group that I largely study, which is Black diasporic immigrants, this is how, um, how vast an, a Black immigrant can be. Their identity can be um, so dynamic and diverse. So you have the, the Pan-African diaspora, which is anyone that, um, any community that uh, exists out of the dispersion, the historic dispersion of Africans throughout the world. You have Africans, typically you um, identify an African by a region. You have North African or Middle Eastern, which is MENA. You have Sub-Saharan Africans, so on and so forth. You have African Americans. Uh, which are um, those who have ancestral ties to slaves in America. Then you have Africans in America who are those who migrated. You have Afro-Caribbean and then Afro-Latinx. Now, you also have ethnic groups within that. So you may be an Igbo of Nigeria or a Garifuna of Central America with the term tribe being outmoded. And then a person may also be mixed ethnic or of mixed ethnic ancestry, such as a Creole. Um, so you may have the Creole of Louisiana, um, and this is typically a mixture of Black, American Indian, and African and European ancestry. It can also be a language. Now this should not be uh, confused with national or nationality references such as Chicano or Catracho for Honduranians, um, Boricuan for Puerto Ricans or Bajan for Barbados, Creole is really a mix or um, a homogenization of different ethnicities. And then, you know, you may refer to regionality. So a black immigrant may come from the Caribbean or West Indies, but then although there's some overlap, certain terms are not used interchangeably. For example, Caribbean or Latin America. So a person may be of Latinx descent, um, not to be confused with Hispanic. And I'm just teasing these out so that you can see uh, how vast an intersection might be. And so a person who is Latinx can be from any um, Latin American country, whether or not that country is a Hispanic or Spanish speaking country. Spanish is the country, um, a person from Spain or the language of Spain, which should not be confused with Hispanic. Then you have Anglophone, Francophone or Hispanic as in Spanish speaking and Lusophone as in Portuguese speaking. So a person from Brazil is Latinx. Um, so these are the different nuances. Um, then you also have to look at the age at migration. This is very important. And again, within population studies, this is teased out and we do not take care to do this in LIS. You may have a first generation immigrant, but within that, a person who is generation 1.75 migrated closer to birth versus a person who migrated in generation 1.25, which is closer to adulthood. And language patterns, acculturation, um, so many things, um, so many variables differ based on whether you're 1.75 and 1.25. Um, 
the term second generation is no longer used in in um, academic circles because it's a very controversial term. You're either U.S. born or you're not. No one is second generation. You're first born American, right? So just really um, acknowledging birthright citizenship. And then you may be a person who fled your country and then um, was granted refugee status in the U.S., or fled your country, entered the U.S., and then sought um, asylum, which is an asylee. An undocumented person is a person who migrated without official uh, documentation or a visa, basically a person who migrated without a visa. Um, and uh, sorry, I have that one twice. Let's go down to permanent resident, which is a person who's achieved green card status, naturalized citizen, becomes a citizen. But many people are in fluid status, um, and that's because policy is ever changing. And so the ways in which a person becomes undocumented are myriad. And so policy might change. Also, your documentation and process may be um, backlogged and you go out of status because of the backlog. And so you may also live in a mixed status household where um, a person might be a first generation or um, a birthright citizen and uh, then the parents might be uh, undocumented or maybe um, other relatives in the home may be undocumented or they may have a green card. Some of them may be naturalized. So it's very easy to be in mixed status and fluid status um, in, this, in this current environment. So I just wanted to show you how complicated and complex immigration is and identity is. Um, I want to uh, really challenge us to think about why people migrate. And um, this is actually very important in our work in libraries. Oftentimes we begin with the end, um, but it's very important to, especially when you're um, serving an entire community, whether it's a campus community or a neighborhood community, if you have many of the same type of people, you may want to investigate why those individuals migrated and that may inform their information behavior. And so some people migrate as a result of opportunity, and this is considered voluntary migration. So this may entail voluntary um, family reunification, education, or employment. We have a lot of highly skilled immigrants right now that are contributing to the response to COVID-19 and a lot of DACA recipients as well. There is also forced migration, and that's another reason for migrating, to achieve stability. We see that natural disaster, uh, armed conflict, and political uh, displacement also causes migration. And so these are usually um, regarded as forced migrants. Um, and so my uh, goal is to help people think about how information helps immigrants move, integrate, and become socially included within society. And I offer a few recommendations on how to make this happen. Um, first, it's important to recognize that in um, 2020, basically, in the era in which we're living, the smartphone is really the modern day compass for all intents and purposes. So we saw that with the Syrian uh, migrant crisis of 2016 and um, people had their smartphones, they were getting services, connecting with relatives as they migrated throughout Turkey and into Europe. And we saw that again in 2018 with the Central American migrant crisis. And again, people could not do without their cell phones. And I have a lot of rich stories and anecdotes from people who migrated and this was their experience. So number one, um, and overall, this is the takeaway. We need to figure out how to address immigrant well-being from an information standpoint. So moving away from um, a purely procedural, purely transactional um, kind of approach to a more holistic approach. How can we focus on well-being? And so we first should understand how immigrants personalize information. So we can amplify positives and get away from the deficit mindset that has prevailed. 
And so we should be looking at pre-migration information behavior. What was the community's interaction with libraries before? Was it uh, primarily academic or scholastic in scope? Um, was there an availability of public libraries? Do they need to be introduced to the US interpretation of a public library? Um, I'll give you an example. In uh, conducting focus groups with Afro-Caribbean um, uh, immigrants, some of them um, recounted that they had to adhere to, uh, what is it, dress codes before entering a public library in their country of origin. Um, so the idea of a library that has, for example, gaming or yoga, that may need to be introduced or contextualized, right? So it's important to think about pre-migration information behavior and also information assets. There's some really cool ways that immigrants are using information and um, personalizing and creating information tools as well. And we should also think about those. And I'll give you some examples. And we should also be thinking about how diasporas um, rely on information environments and how networks are so important. And um, information tools help immigrants stay connected around the world. And one person calls immigrants e-actors or translocal actors, meaning that they cross boundaries um, in really rich ways. So we also must understand how information is used to marginalize immigrants. And um, in our work um, as librarians or future librarians, we should address injustices. For example, um, information is very much tied to ethnocentric and nativist discourse. For example, e illegal versus undocumented. We can choose to use undocumented versus illegal. Um, and there is an ongoing fight to change our own Library of Congress subject heading illegal alien. Um, and this has been a years long fight and LOC still has not changed it. Um, and we can also combat misinformation and disinformation about immigrants, especially in the current political environment and as we um, address this pandemic. And it's important to also understand the role of automation and algorithms and algorithmic bias in how immigrants are treated. For example, automated deportation and Palantir, which is the, uh, the algorithm or the software that decides who gets to stay and who um, is deported. And so all of this is um, based on software and um, flawed software as well as surveillance. Pentil is used to surveil uh, those who are um, screened for deportation and um, it, certain smartphone applications are surveilled, um, very popular ones, um, Facebook, for example, social, uh, other social media. And Ventel is used to keep track and geolocate those who are undocumented. So we can also in our work understand how immigration um, is used to marginalize. We can address those injustices. We must also understand the health and psychological implications of information. And we can do uh, this work by promoting wellness. We can understand, for example, acculturative stress, which is stress brought on by um, the strain of adjusting to a new culture. Um, this used to be referred to as culture shock, but now uh, there is substantiated, especially medical literature on um, the immigrant health paradox, for example, meaning that those who uh, arrive in the U.S. usually arrive in fairly good health. Um, either they have passed strict screenings, health screenings, or they have made long journeys. However, within five years or as time in the U.S. progresses, health outcomes deteriorate. And so this is called the immigrant health paradox. We can also understand vital information grounds that help mitigate some of these risks such as places of worship, parks, and markets. We can partner with those locations and we can also understand how immigrants can be informed and civically engaged. Uh, right now I'm working on a project to help immigrants be um, involved and included in the 2020 census because there was so much misinformation and also um, strategic uh, marginalization as it pertained to the census. So we can also promote informed citizenship. 
I introduce a framework for training librarians and training MLS students. It's called the HEART framework. And uh, we can go one by one through the acronym. The first one is humanitarianism. And we should, as much as possible, remember that uh, engaging with immigrant communities is not just a one directional transaction. Um, you are also doing humanitarian work. Number two is experience. As much as possible, we should uh, try to understand the immigrant experience um, and not simply promote uh, conformism, but uh, adjusting and acculturation, it, it should be our outcome and our goal. The next one is acculturation and acculturating to the U.S. Notice I have not said assimilation, but acculturating to the U.S. is a long process. Some people estimate that full acculturation takes about 20 years. So what is that experience? What are the different stages of acculturation? That's also very important. The next one is realism. Too often, library work is um, naive and rooted in pragmatism, what, what someone Bushman has called Deweyan pragmatism, right, where we only focus on the policy, the service, and we forget that beyond the library, there's an entire socio-political context that we should be aware of. And lastly, transnationalism. You're dealing with communities when you engage with immigrants who are uh, very, very transnational. They are here, but they're also at home. And information tools and information uh, really allows people to be um, global e-actors. One tool for learning how to be um, a humanitarian librarian, it's called Mind of Five, and it was developed by researchers, uh, primarily Dr. Ricardo Gomez at the University of Washington's iSchool. And um, you can use a card game to play with uh, your peers, or if you're in a library setting, you can use it to introduce, especially ethics, information ethics and privacy. How do you engage with immigrant communities, migrant communities, undocumented communities, and really keep their stories and their experiences private? So this is one tool. There's another tool that you can use called the Immigrant Experience, and this was introduced through uh, Experience Magazine. And it's a simulation. It's a game where you can take a journey. Um, this is a game that's based in many different decades. I think there's eight actors or eight um, avatars in total. And you'll see how complicated the decision to migrate is. It's never as simple as I'm going to the US for a better life. Uh, oftentimes, you're leaving behind children, dependents, uh, elderly parents, and so this is another tool that you can use to kind of simulate the immigrant experience. Another tool you can use, this one was developed by a librarian. She's the same person who um, came up with the concept, she coined the concept of vocational awe for Bazi Etar, and she created this game, Killing Me Softly, and this is a game that simulates um, the experience of a person, a marginalized person, an underrepresented person being um, really experiencing microaggression every day and the toll that it takes out. So she borrows from the idea of acculturative stress, which comes from migration literature, but she argues that anyone can experience acculturative stress if they are from an underrepresented community. So this is a good tool to understand immigrants and other underrepresented groups, and I highly recommend it. And we should also be trying to understand realism, social realism, right? And so not um, a, a plasticity of diversity, but really understanding the different layers of diversity and equity and inclusion. And so you can um, use the International Human Rights Coalition archives in conjunction with the Digital Public Library of America. They have chronicled an entire archive and, and catalog of immigrant stories, how they came here, what were the decisions and rich videos and reading material. There's a host of other tools here that you can kind of immerse yourself in just to understand immigrant stories.
And um, Jill E. Barron is a librarian at Dartmouth University, and she is um, uh, one of the people who has been advocating for a change of the LLC subject heading Illegal Aliens. I would really recommend that you uh, watch this video as well so that you can understand the impact of language and the power of cataloging and classification classification and um, really categorizing people. It's, it's always a political act. We are on a marathon, Michelle. <laughs> okay, the next slide is transnationalism. How are immigrants using information tools and creating information tools? So they're not just information users, but creators. And so Remitly is an application that allows people to kind of um, to send money home. And so remittances, if you've never heard the term, remittances are money um, funds that are sent back to a country um, from a relative abroad. And so some countries, their entire GDP, gross domestic product, it, it relies, their economies rely on remittances. And remittances is sometimes the only guaranteed way to help the poor. That trickles down. Where aid may not trickle down, remittances are guaranteed to make it to poor households. In Haiti, remittances account for 25% of the entire uh, economy. So Remitly is an app that helps you send money much cheaper than Western Union. Um, and so that was created with immigrants in mind. WhatsApp was created by an immigrant who was undocumented and later on welfare. Um, and he created it with uh, immigrants in mind. And there's also Find Hello app, which helps you find um, other immigrants from your country and uh, healthcare, housing, legal help um, after, uh, you know, migrating and seeking integration here in the U.S. So these are the types of um, networks and social tools that immigrants are using in, in amazing ways. It's important to understand that libraries are part of information systems. And as librarians, we should um, seek to promote the freedom to receive, seek, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. This is a UN Declaration of Human Rights, and it should be our imperative to make this a reality. There is one that came very early on, um, a question regarding what is the best way to address language barriers? Mm, okay. Um, one of my colleagues, his name is Kelvin Watson, I'm trying to remember what library he's at. What he has done is provided, uh, this is one recommendation, if there's no staff on site um, or um, maybe even volunteers, on site, you can use apps or dedicated um, tablets to help mitigate the language barrier. So there's a lot of apps, Google Translate, for example, um, that will help you communicate with people who are non-English speakers. So they have used um, iPads, Broward County Library System, that's the one it is, Broward County Library System. They have used iPads. Um, to help, and this is a library system in South Florida. So again, um, Spanish speaking, Haitian Creole speaking communities, many different kinds of immigrants right outside of Miami. So they have been using tablets for some time and it's been incredibly successful. I would highly recommend that you look it up um, and see. And um, sometimes uh, libraries have partnered with community leaders to have volunteers who can um, help with translation as well between specific hours. Um, and then also the librarians can have language classes for library staff um, to help them learn the language as well. So the burden shouldn't be just on participants or patrons rather. Okay, thank you. There's another question are ebooks and e services popular for immigrants? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. And um, especially, you wouldn't believe, a lot of people, and uh, Karen Dolly has done work on this reading and reading in stealth mode. And, um, uh, you know, one librarian, her name is Anita, she's at the university, at Tulane University now. That's how she learned English um, by reading alone, solitary 
and um, translating books that she had read in her native Polish language to English. And so um, a lot of uh, literature is saying that uh, reading an ebook, smartphone, anything applications on the smartphone, they are used for people in a non-intimidating, self-paced way to learn a language as well. Um, not just uh, uh, language apps or language ESL classes, but ebooks help people learn a language in a way that is comfortable for them. So yes. Excellent. Um, let me move to the next question. As we learn as individuals more about how to move towards amplifying positives, are there suggestions on how to introduce this information to colleagues and move towards more institutional changes? So really looking at ways to increase chances of buy-in. I would, I would really recommend that you have little vignettes and um, distribute examples of immigrants, um, and this, especially examples that disrupt common ideas. Um, so I would really take time every week or once a month to highlight a different immigrant. It could be as simple as saying, did you know Steve Jobs? He's of Syrian descent, right? Um, and really demonstrating the diversity and the vastness of immigrant communities and sharing that, or maybe even reading a common book um, as a library among work staff and uh, talking about that book. Um, I would recommend Nugent's The Refugees or Edward Dante Katz, um, you know, any of her works really, but Father I'm Dying is one. And so any immigrant refugees, their, their works, their books. Um, and so I just really would encourage you to as much as possible make the implied explicit and disseminate counter stories um, about immigrants. Excellent, that's great suggestions. Here's another one. Um, could you recommend, uh, and I know you did talk a little bit about some tools or resources, but could you recommend any tools or resources to apply the scope of this presentation to an academic library context? Yeah, um, this is so important, especially because a lot of people forget the, that international students Although international students are not considered immigrants, not by um, INS, because um, the idea is that they're not immigrating, that, that they'll go back home after. Um, so F1 visas are not considered immigration visas, but still the experience is the same. Even if they enter information rich settings and they have a lot of support systems in place, the cultural experience is the same. So in your work as an academic librarian, I would really um, uh, encourage you to think about pre-migration norms, how do international students use apps and applications. Um, and so this is very applicable to even a K-12 setting, thinking about the parents' experience, right? So media specialists, academic librarians, um, this talk was not just uh, geared toward public librarians, so it is definitely applicable to college or campus libraries as well. Thank you. Uh, another question, you referenced informed citizen a few mm -hmm. slides back. Uh, is there any move to reframe good citizenship information models as we're serving people who may not be citizens in the legal sense? If I understand the question correctly, um, it is a question about what is, what is meant by citizenship. I think that's what the question is getting at. Um, and really civic engagement is the idea. So not just immigration process, but how to take part. And one of the things that I've been doing, I've been working with um, Asian American groups, uh, Latinx groups, um, Black diasporic groups, um, to get the word out about the census. And this is because not everyone can vote, but everyone can be represented. Everyone needs to be represented in the census, right? And so civic engagement can be done whether or not you are documented, whether or not you're a citizen. And so this can just be as simple as um, staying abreast. How do you stay abreast? How do you know what's legitimate? And we can help with that. We can definitely recommend tools as librarians to help uh, manage information and apply information. Thank you. And if that didn't fully address um, your question, go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll get to that. 
Uh, but thank you. So let's move on to the next one. We have about five minutes. Uh, do you think that libraries and information centers that are providing services to underrepresented groups like undocumented immigrants should receive additional revenue or funding? I don't know whether they should receive additional funding, but I do know that, um, and I can't speak for the main source of funding, IMLS, I do know that uh, agencies and our large partners, even ALA's mission has changed from looking at the provision of information to quality of life of communities. So when you think about quality of life, everyone benefits when everyone in your community is doing well. So I think the imperative is shifting and, um, and this is a good thing for undocumented immigrants because ultimately many agencies recognize that um, whether or not a person is in fluid status, changing status, undocumented, going to be deported, it is to the advantage of a neighborhood, municipality, a state, if everyone is thriving. So IMLS, ALA, um, so many other groups are concerned now with how we do our work, but how people are uh, benefiting socially from our work. So I don't know that there, whether um, there will be, especially not in this current um, political landscape, any special funding for that work, but our uh, services should be relevant regardless of whether a person, it should be relevant regardless of whether a person is documented basically. Um, and we should care about how our communities are doing. And I think you touched on, there was a follow-up about recommending funding sources or places to go for funding. So I think you addressed that um, in that question. How about another question here? Do you have some specific suggestions to connect with a hard to reach immigrant population? I would say um, begin with a thought leader or an opinion leader in that group. Usually the most visible leaders are the, the business people, the ones who own the markets, um, faith-based leaders as well. Um, I would reach out to them and ask them what they need. Um, also, Immigrant Radio, do not underestimate Immigrant Radio, yo. It is so amazing um, if they can just play uh, or even just give a shout out to the library or if you can buy ad space on Immigrant Radio, um, that will help gain some credibility for the library. But then a simple thing, which we overlook all the time is inviting immigrant groups to just come and use the library space for meeting space. And if you have a rental fee, think about waiving that. Or if um, a group doesn't have their 501c3 status yet, waiving it for them. Invite them to just come and have a meeting in your space. And you'll see how they begin to ask. You'll see how they'll notice the signage. You'll see how when you have a program and invite them, they are, they are already um, present. So no, no, uh, no agenda, just inviting people to say, hey, you know, you have this meeting on, you know, maternal health in, among Somali women in Minnesota. Have you thought about meeting in the library? That's it, right? No commitment or nothing. And just that invitation and that outreach might be the relationship starter. I love that. I think I think that's a really good note to end on. I know there are about eight more questions we did not get to, but I will send them over to you, Anna, and then we can uh, perhaps, if you want to address them in writing, we could post them as a link along with your recording. I thank you all for hanging on. And we want to thank you uh, for your expertise, um, all of the information you shared for your time, and to all of the attendees we appreciate each of you for taking time out of your day to attend yet another Zoom. So <laughs> thank you everyone and look for the recording to be posted on our website.